video is sponsored by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested in helping get the most music from the least gear. I feel like things have been piling up to encourage me to try a deluxe reverb. When the new Tone Master Deluxes were released, I was at Rick Beato's studio and I had a chance to play one, and I was seriously impressed. Of course, I'd made my own short history video about the Defender Deluxe. I learned a lot about who used them and all the great music that had been played on them. Then my buddy Zach Childs made a great video on his own amp journey, ultimately concluding that the Deluxe Reverb was the amp for him. Zach's the sort of guy that when he says something, well, you can either listen or you might wish you had. I often hear this quote from John Bollinger from a premier guitar rig rundown we got through trap in my head. It's pretty rare to be playing with a band that a deluxe won't cut. You know? Right, yeah. I mean, you'll I mean like if you're loud enough where a deluxe isn't going to cut, then you're really loud. Yeah, you're going to be pretty loud. I remain haunted by the image of two of my all-time favorite guitarists, Eric Johnson and Mike Stern, touring together a couple years ago, each using a pair of deluxe reverb amps. Some of my favorite pedal builders, David Barber, Brad Jetter, and Zach Broyles, have each told me that they use a deluxe reverb as the platform they use for designing their pedals. And no less authority than Andy Martin from Pro Guitar Shop, Reverb Tone Report, and Andy's Demos fame confirmed the choice of a DR for all their pedal demos when he guessed it on that pedal show. I think it was 2009 we took a vote. AC30, Twin Reverb, Deluxe Reverb, you know, what do you want to see? And it was just hands down the Deluxe Reverb. Oh, and wow. I had never really played those kind of clean Fender amps. It was always these guys. So Marshall is yeah. where you live. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. The pressure was building. And believe it or not, in 45 years of guitar playing, I've never owned one. I've become fascinated with this idea of having just one amp for all my playing. I think that most of us don't get to put in enough hours to get to know lots of different gear. I suspect we might be best served really getting to know one piece at a time. So why a deluxe? I don't think we ask ourselves why often enough. In this case, I'm looking for an amp that will do my low wattage at home playing, but also make it easy to grab that amp and have enough power to go off and gig or jam. That's the why of exploring this particular 22 watt possibility. But maybe you're thinking, hey, a deluxe isn't a 5 watt amp, and this is 5 watt world, right? Let me tell you a quick story. I have this old friend, Colin Lord, a guy I met at Binghamton University. And maybe 15 years ago, we were sharing childhood stories over coffee. We were talking about wearing hand-me-down clothes. He said something that struck me. One day, his grandmother was helping him put on a pair of pants that were too big for him. As he complained about their size, she tightened his belt a couple of notches and said, Too big is a fit. Too big is a fit has become this mantra in my head that I apply to lots of things in my life that are not a perfect fit, but maybe perfectly good enough in practice. I began to wonder if this obsession I had with doing everything with one amp might include too big as a fit. Before I go any further, I need to say that I'm always a little conflicted when I talk about a specific product here. I've not and will never be paid to promote a piece of gear here. I have no stake in whether Fender sells more amps this season, nor even if whether you end up buying a different amp after watching this video. That's not my thing at all. I'm just here telling the story of me exploring what's enough in my own gear. And if there are then lessons that might help you out, then that's a bonus. I'm very grateful that you take the time to listen to my stories, watch the videos, and share your own search in the comments. So with that impression of the original Tone Master firmly in my memory, I was perhaps a little too prepared when Fender announced the special edition Blonde Tone Master Deluxe. They tweaked the amp model, making them more balanced and pedal friendly. They changed the speaker as well to a Celestion. So I emailed Fender and asked if they wouldn't send me one for testing. The amp arrived in late October. It's rare that I try new gear, and even rarer that I make a video about it, because I want to have to have spent months playing it before giving my impressions. So by early November, it had become the amp sitting next to me in the loft where I do the majority of my playing, and it's not left there since. But you know me. I couldn't leave well enough alone. And I felt that I had to test the amp side by side with the original Black Tolex, first generation Tone Master. So I jumped on Reverb and I grabbed a used one. And that was really helpful. But then I had a back and forth with my old friend, Wednesday night jam session partner and guitar teacher extraordinaire from back in New Hampshire, Jared Taylor. In the time I'd known Jared, he'd gone through a number of amps. A 70s Silverface Deluxe, 
then a Princeton reissue with a 12-inch speaker, and finally, a recent hand-wired 64 Custom Deluxe Reverb from the Custom Shop. And here, he'd stayed. He plays sessions, singer-songwriter gigs, and straight-ahead jazz gigs, all with the 64 Custom. It's become his main amp. Around that same time, I watch my buddy Rhett's videos on both the Tone Master and the Two Notes Captor X. Between Jared and Rhett, it got me thinking about trying a 64 Custom with that Captor X. Besides, I needed a push to sell some of the amps in the basement that I'd kept in the past gear purges. The amps, many of which I'd built myself from scratch with my good friend Dan Lurie at FYD, were the hardest to let go of. So it was with this specific goal in mind, I sold off the pile of gear and found a good deal on a 64 Custom Deluxe as well. And so by December, I had the original Tone Master, the new blonde version Tone Master, and the 64 Deluxe. But how best to compare the three amps? First, to minimize the variables, I put my favorite Celestian Neo Creamback speaker in both the first gen black Tone Master and the 64 Custom, so I'd be listening to the same speaker in each. Unlike the 65 reissue, which is made of plywood, all three of these amps use a solid pine cabinet to keep weight, rather than price, down, and the measurements of the cabinets are identical as well. I really like the idea of pitting the Tone Masters against Fender's hand-built all-tube deluxe. But like the Tide, it comes in and then it has to recede. It was time to start applying the what's enough and to eliminate the excess. This is the question that really drives this channel. My standing definition of enough comes from Patrick Rohn's book, Enough. There he says that a sense of what is enough can only come from having had too little and from having had too much. That only by experiencing both extremes can we really know what's enough for us right now. And so having started with none, my OCD self ended up with three amps for taste testing. So I settled into playing all three of them and learning firsthand what makes them unique, all the while thinking about what would stay and what would go. The Tone Master series of amps started in 2019 with a deluxe reverb and a twin as digitally modeled versions of the original amps from the 1960s. But these solid state modeling amps are not designed to sound like a big batch of amps, like a Helix or a Kemper is. Rather, they use all their processing power to emulate that one specific vintage amplifier. I'm going to go through them in the order that I got them. Last fall, Fender released the Blonde Tone Master Deluxe Limited model in rough blonde Tolex and oxblood grill cloth. The new amp model emulates a few of the common mods that players have done to deluxes over the years. First, they clipped the bright cap. Well, virtually they did. In the original tube amp circuit, there's a capacitor going across the volume control pot that is intended to aid in the ability of the amp to cut through the mix at lower volumes. The capacitor lets the highs pass the resistance of the volume pot while sending some of the mids and lows to ground. So the amp is actually brightest at the lowest volumes. Turned all the way up, the capacitor would have no effect because the volume pot would be wide open. But most players never run their amps anywhere near wide open, and the amp is just too bright for their taste. This can become even more of a problem when running drive pedals into the channel at lower volumes. Fender also changed the slope of the reverb pot giving it more gradual increase to the reverb. This effectively gives us a wider range of useful reverb for that first half of the swing from 1 to 5. The other major change in the Blonde version is the speaker that's used. Switching from a Jensen Neo, the Blonde has a Celestian Neo Creamback speaker. Celestians are a common speaker swap in 60 style fenders because they put back some of the mids that the tone stack takes away. We all grew up with the sound of a classic scooped mids of a Fender amp, and that's all still there. With the Celestian, there's just a little bit more mids filling in, lifting the bottom of the scoop up a bit, if you follow me. They've also changed the impulse response, or IRs, speaker emulated direct on the XLR output on the back panel to match the Celestian. Here you get the sound of the Neo Creamback mic'd with a Shure SM57 and a Sennheiser 421, a classic mic combination that gives you all the complex mid-range from the 57 and fills in the bottom with the 421. Those are the highlights, and I like the blonde version right out of the box. As I said earlier, though I've played Fender amps for decades, I've never owned a Deluxe, so this was me wading into new waters. And to overextend that metaphor, it encouraged me to head to deeper water by buying another amp, the original Tone Master. The first of the two Tone Master Deluxe amps came in black and silver livery, as they did in the mid to late 60s. That first version goes to great lengths in an attempt to sound exactly like the tubed up version. The amp has been very successful for Fender, and though it might not sound exactly, or feel exactly, like your original 60s Deluxe, it's as good as is realistically possible. Remember, every amp, after 60 years of aging, would sound and feel a little different. 
has to do with lots of factors, but like guitars, it's important to remember that they're all unique instruments. It's the sum of their specific parts combined with how many gigs they've seen, how much they've been played, and who's done the maintenance over the years. As I mentioned earlier, this amp came with the original tones in place. If you're looking for that big 60s surf sound and that cut through everything bright channel, then this is likely the tone master for you. It also comes with a Jensen Neo speaker that's voiced to sound like the original Alnico speakers that came in those 60s amps, and the IRs available at the XLR output on the back are of that speaker as well. I bought this amp used from a studio player in Florida, and he'd removed the Tone Master nameplate from the front of the amp. And at a glance, or a listen, you'd never know this wasn't a tube version. Well, unless you needed to move it, and then you presumably notice the featherweight 24 pounds that makes this amp so appealing to the average gigging player. This Tone Master model is currently the lowest priced deluxe reverb in the Fender catalog, just a little bit lower than the blonde version. One of my favorite features that they've built into these solid state emulations of the original is the virtual attenuation switch on the back panel. You can rotate this from a 22 watt emulation of the original down past 5 watts to just 0.2 watts. I say emulation because this is not the attenuated tube power section that a regular amp would have. It's dialing the amp model to respond as if being attenuated, changing the room volume at which the amp will start to break up. This is incredibly useful for playing at home, and I regularly have it set to 12 watts or even down to 5 watts. And though labeled as 22 watts, this is actually a 100 watt solid state amp, which can easily produce volumes comparable to, or higher than, the original tube 22 watt amplifier. The only thing keeping this from being the amp that I'd recommend to every guitar player heading off to music school is the lack of a headphone jack that would disable the speaker. This could have been done easily on the back panel, preserving the classic looks of the front. You can rig this up with the IR output, but that's a little fiddly, especially when they could have easily added the jack. Maybe in a future version? Fender, I hope you're listening. Of these two Tone Master versions, I came out on the side of the blonde version. It fits the warm jazz and blues tones that I'm usually chasing, and I find it works better with my favorite overdrive pedals. But having experienced the difference between these two TMs, I was about to jump into the deep end of the pool and go for the full tube deluxe reverb experience with the 64 custom handwired deluxe reverb from the Fender Custom Shop. Though very much based on the original 64 circuit, the boys at Fender couldn't resist the word custom in the name, it seems. Like others have done in the, over the years, they made the reverb and vibrato available on both normal and bright channels. This is pretty handy as you can get the classic reverb on both of those channels, and they're voiced quite a bit differently. And they've clipped the bright cap on the normal channel, so you get a distinctly different voice there. An interesting feature of this amp is that turning the volume up brings more mid-range forward. It lessens the depth of the scoopiness of the original blackface circuit, and is a big part of why deluxes sound so good overdriven. Like a vintage deluxe, the 64 breaks up a little earlier than the current 65 reissue would, but it also winds up more gradually, giving you a more subtle controllability for different types of guitars. I found this responsiveness pretty seductive, and I can see the 64 Custom settling in for a long stay as the main amp here in the loft. Right about now you might be yelling at the screen, Wait, hey, isn't this 5 watt world? And yeah, yeah it is, which is where the two notes Captor X comes in. The Captor X adds two great features to this all tube rig. It lets me attenuate at two levels. There's a three way switch, but the top position is full, letting the volume all through to the speaker. The middle position or club setting is minus 20 dB and the low or home setting is minus 38 dB. As the Captor X will handle everything up to a 100 watt amp, I imagine the three settings would be pretty different in practice with a much bigger amp. A 100 watt Marshall cranked and then attenuated by minus 20 dB would still be pretty darn loud, but with the 22 watter, the attenuating settings were pretty quiet. So with the 64 Custom, I found that the middle club setting was a sweet spot for at home. If anything, it could be a touch louder. But if you're frustrated by having just the three position switch, you just have to revisit how this was all done before master volume amps became a thing in the early 1980s. Turn the amp up on your preferred attenuator setting, then turn the guitar down until it cleans up to where you want it to be. And bada bing, you have a fully adjustable overall volume knob right there on your guitar. The other thing the Captor X adds is a headphone jack. This is great with the speaker turned off for silent tube filled practice. And this worked great, but there was one real problem. In my opinion, there should be a warning label when using with headphones on the reverb and tremolo settings of the amp. You see, I try to use Mondays for administration stuff for the channel, paying bills, touching base with my favorite companies, but I also try to start every day running some drills on the guitar to loosen up my hands and my head for the day. 
But with a pair of headphones into the Captor X coming from the 64 Custom, and with that tube-based reverb and bias tremolo, and all of a sudden it was time for lunch. <laughs> What's the saying? These are good problems to have. So how do these three deluxes compare for my use at home, or who do I think each amp is for? Outside of heavy music, the deluxe long ago proved its worth in pretty much every category. Jazz, country, studio workhorse, blues, pop. The deluxe has proved its worth everywhere. But what about playing metal on a deluxe? We might assume the issues are image first and volume second. A 12-inch combo isn't really what I think of as part of my backline for heavy music. But the stage volume coming through a deluxe is really probably enough in most clubs and the sound guy would be loving the direct out from either the Captor X with the 64 Custom or the direct out of the Tone Masters. But heavy music, that's really not my thing. Who could we ask? I know. Let's ask Fluff. Can a deluxe do metal? Yeah, actually, actually it can. Uh, it's so clean and such a perfect pedal platform that... You know, it's it's very, very well suited for preamps and distortion pedals such as the KSR series. Just as an example, using a dirt preamp into a deluxe is actually a wonderful combination which will result in super, super tight molten metal tones. Go figure. Now you might say, hey, I can find an original for the kind of money it would cost to buy a 64 Custom. And you'd be right. But the 64 Custom acts like a vintage amp without the vintage amp issues of reliability or collectability. So, that's why, you know, I love these amps. Um, I've never been disappointed in them. Uh, they always produce a, a, a pleasing sound, and, uh, and I love them. Um, I do have two of them, and the reason I have two is that whenever I'm doing a paid gig, you know, someone's paying me to play, I bring both of them. And the reason I do is in case, you know, one of them goes down. Old amps are, well, old, and stuff comes loose or fails. A recently built, hand-wired amp is just plain going to be more reliable than one that has 50 years and Lord knows how many miles on it. And this one comes with a warranty. So I'd say the 64 Custom is perfect for anyone looking for a vintage amp mojo without the vintage amp trouble. Of course, this is also at near vintage prices, so that's the obvious bit on the Custom that will exclude some. The original Tone Master in black, livery, bright circuit in place, piles of reverb, and the deep mid-scoop of the Jensen Neo speaker, doing its best impression of an old Jensen Alco. Well, that's the classic version, and that's the one I'd recommend for anyone who already has an old one at home, either a 60s or a 70s version, that they're just now hesitant to drag out to gigs. If you're used to that old circuit, this is about as close as you can get. I'd agree that the 65 reissue is an alternative, of course, but I just can't justify the weight. I often remember what a very successful YouTuber said in an interview I heard a couple of years ago. 90% is still an A. And at the end of the night, having played with the band and carrying it out with its simple vinyl covering, weighing in at just 24 pounds, that Tone Master is definitely an A. The blonde version does everything the original Tone Master does, but for me, it just does it all a little better. I like the smoother attack of this model. It makes it more pedal friendly, particularly for use with overdrives. So to me, the Blonde TM is the all-around version. If you like the classic black, but prefer the sound of the Blonde version, like me, you're in luck. Since this is a digital model of the original, Fender built into the ability to update the firmware, and so the model inside the Blonde amp can be downloaded and installed on your black Tone Master in a matter of minutes. You simply download a file, plug in a mini USB cable into the jack on the amp, the amp shows up on your computer screen like a hard drive, you drag the upgrade file to the amp, and you're done. I know this because I've done it. I like the original aesthetics and honestly I like that at a glance you can't tell the Tone Master from the 64 Custom sitting next to it. And that's where I've settled for a while. If I had a grab and go gig I'd likely grab the Tone Master. With the blonde firmware in place and the Neo Creamback speaker installed, gig bag over my shoulder, a minimalist pedal board running on a Volto battery pack and I'm out the door. The Custom will live in my home studio with a Two Notes Captor X kind of permanently sitting on top. I've partnered with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade. My playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. 
you can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the Muse takes you. I love their tagline, Learn, Practice, and Play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. So summing up, I still think that a 5 water is a great fit for most people's needs if they're just playing at home. To me, it's the perfect size. But if you're going to start gigging out or going to regular jam sessions that include a drummer, then you're probably headed north of 10 watts, and 22 watts has proven itself a reasonable size over the decades. You can then simply turn things down for home use with a solid state attenuator or with something like the Captor X. You'd be doing more with less, and that continues to intrigue me. And maybe you too. Colin's grandmother might have been right when it comes to trying and doing it all with one amp. Too big is a fit. If you have your own deluxe story, or your own too big is a fit story, post it down in the comments. Or if you used to cart around a twin reverb with JBLs and decided that you've had enough, I want to hear that too. We all start and end in different places. First, I need to thank the inimitable RJ Ronquillo for sharing the recording of him playing his Strat into a first gen deluxe tone master. If you're not already a fan, start watching RJ's YouTube channel for his ever inspiring playing. I need to thank Perry McManus for editing a script on an amp that might well be, in his opinion, woefully underpowered. We have a friendship where the phrase, there's no replacement for displacement, comes up periodically. I need to thank Fluff from Riffs, Beards, and Gear for his muddled up opinion on using a deluxe in his world of down-tuned gigging. I need to thank Mick and Dan of That Pedal Show for sharing the clip of Andy Martin. I need to thank the guys at Premier Guitar for the regular use of the clip from John Bollinger from their rig down with Guthrie Trap. I need to thank my friend Zach Childs for the use of his clip from his excellent and popular video on the Deluxe Reverb Amp. You should go check it out over at his channel. There's a link to each of the episodes above in the description. I need to thank all of you that stopped by the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or the Stomp preset pack. And in particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt. It's an ever-growing group of guitar obsessives, and I appreciate all your support of 5 Watt World. If you enjoyed my look at the Fender Deluxes, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt World.